this video is going to be about the two sample t test. This is like the most formal model we've seen yet in this class, which is really pretty exciting because once we get to a modeling point of the content of statistics, that's when we start really exploring how to apply the methods. Even though this isn't an applied class, I'm going to showcase some of the more popular applied methods anyway, and this will be our first. It's called a two-sample t-test. The name is only somewhat indicative of what this model does, so we'll start out with a description of the model. I'll start out with just plain words, just so we get a reasonable sense of what the model is doing, and then I will write it out in statistical notation. Next up, I'll try to draw us a picture that helps us visualize the model as best we can. And then we will jump into R and uh, create one of our long lost segments on show me the data. So let's get started. Description of the model first. We want a description of the two sample t test. This shouldn't be so bad. This is one of our intro level models. It is a model used, I guess it's a statistical model, but that should go without saying here, a model used to compare the mean, and that is not the sample mean here. This is the mean of the distributions from which the original data came. We will use the data to tell us things about the means of the distributions. This is the goal of statistics. We're going to try to use the data to tell us about the means of the original distributions that generated the data we have. So a two-sample t-test is a model used to compare the means of two, hence two sample, groups. That's really all there is to it. Say you have two groups that are in some sense comparable. We are going to compare the means of the groups. We want to know if the means differ by the two groups. And this is an excellent case for our conditional densities. So uh, more statistically, we might write this out as we have data Y1 to Yn. So we have a sample size of capital N data points that are independent and identically distributed as normal data. We actually don't really care if the data are normally distributed or not, because the central limit theorem is kind of the workhorse of applied statistics here. And if the data turn out not to be normally distributed, then the central limit theorem is going to kind of kick in and tell us that, well, as long as we're comparing means, then the distribution of the sample means will be approximately normal anyway. Now, this next bit is probably why stats get a bad rap, is because this is probably pretty confusing to interpret right off the bat. But what we're essentially doing is setting up two means such that we can compare them. The first mean is just going to be equal to the value beta naught, and the second mean is going to be equal to the value of beta naught plus beta 1. Now that's a little annoying at first when you probably wanted the first mean just to be some value. Let's call it beta naught because the name is really not the important part here. And the second mean you probably wanted to be just some other value. But the reason we estimate it in two steps like this is that beta 1 here then describes the difference between the first group's mean and the second group's mean. By writing out the two means like this, beta 1 then describes the second, uh, the difference from the first group to the second group. It is the difference between the means. 
So now the question is, what is this X doing? And this X is really just a placeholder. Think of it as like an indicator variable that takes on a one anytime you're looking at data from the second group. And anytime you're not looking at data from the second group, X takes on a zero. So this is really either zero or one. And I don't want us describing this as a Bernoulli random variable because once we have the data, we are claiming here to know the groups. There's nothing random at this point about what value this is once we have the data in mind. We know what the two groups are and we know which data came from which group. So X here is either zero, in which case beta one times zero is zero, and we're left with the first group's mean. Or X is one, in which case we have one times beta one plus beta naught as the second group's mean. Okay, hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. And if it doesn't make perfect sense, I'm hoping this visualization is going to be the end all be all for our understanding of the two sample t-test. So the idea is we have this data where y is some numerical value and x is either zero or one. Since the observations y are normally distributed, what we're really doing is saying there's a mean for the first group. And that mean is equal to beta naught. And maybe different from the first group's mean is the second group's mean, which is beta naught plus beta one. Now the observations y have their respective means, but they also follow some distribution. Now the data are said to follow some distribution because we know not all the data is the same. We know there's random noise to our data. So what we're really trying to ensure is that the means between the two groups, well, we're not trying to ensure anything. We're trying to assess based on the data whether or not the means are close to each other or far apart. And we're trying to see through the noise of our data. So we have means, but we're going to estimate those means based on some data. So the data is going to kind of float around within this normal distribution. More likely values are, to show, are um, going to show up right around here, right around the mean, and less likely values are going to show up in the tails, because that's exactly what our density from the normal distribution is telling us. Same thing for the second group. We've got a mean right here in the middle, but we really have to estimate that mean. We don't know the mean, all we have is data. So we're looking to estimate the mean, and then based on the estimates, we wanna ask, are the estimates close to each other or far apart? And really what's happening here is we are finding an expectation of the density represented by the letter Y, finding a mean, the expectation known as the mean of the distribution for the data Y when X is equal to zero. And that's exactly where this conditional density stuff is coming into play. There is a mean of the data Y given X is equal to zero. So that's the mean for the first group. And similarly here, there is a mean for the data Y given X is equal to one, and that's the mean for the second group. So now our goal is to use the data to estimate the means, use the data to estimate each group's mean, and then evaluate, are the means close to each other or far apart? And close to each other is gonna have a lot of overlap between the distributions for the means themselves. That is different than the distribution of the original data. And means that are different from each other, suggesting that the group's means are different, the distribution of the means themselves will not overlap, as this picture suggests. The distribution of the means themselves will not overlap, whether or not 
the original data does overlap because the original data come from a distribution and the means themselves, the sample means based on the data, which are random variables, come from their own distribution, which by the central limit theorem is approximately normal. So let's go on to my website and go down to this data sets link under the section meta. And we're going to start with a data set about the order of animals named carnivora. You can read about this order, uh, about this data set, about the order of animals carnivora in the text file, but we're just going to immediately jump to the data set itself. We're going to take the raw data and read it into a new file in R. Well, you're going to read it into your course notes. You're just going to name the data set carnivores because it represents the order carnivore. I'm going to read in the data set. And if you want, you can explore the data set in R itself. We're going to focus on the two variables, superfamily, because I know superfamily only has two values, caniformia, and Feliformia. Caniformia is dog-like things, and Feliformia is cat-like things. So that's going to be the value, the variable x, which is either going to be 1 for uh, whether or not the animal is from the group Feliformia or a 0 otherwise. And we'll use the variable representing y named sb. So that is um, brain weights of the animals from the order carnivora. So we're going to compare the brain weights across dogs and cats. Now, I've been making a big point about the difference between the distribution, the distributions that describe the original data and the distributions that describe the sample means. This first plot is known as a box plot. And the boxes are the most informative part. This lower line, this lower value of the box, is the 25th percentile or quantile. This middle line is the median, also known as the 50th quantile. And the top line is the uh, 75th quantile. So this gray shaded area then represents the middle 50% of the data for dog-like animals from the order carnivora. Now, same thing over here. This is the box plot for cat-like animals. You can see the median is just a little bit lower than the median for dogs. And the uh, gray area is the middle 50% of the data for cat-like animals. So there's quite a bit of overlap between the brain weights for dog-like and cat-like animals. So next, I'm going to load this library named gplots. If you don't have this installed, which I doubt you do, then you must install first. And you can just take this line of code here and install the package with it. So just copy that and paste. Oh, I guess you can't copy here, but you can type it out. Install that packages, parentheses, quotes, gplots, and it should go just fine. And the benefit of using that library, which I don't normally recommend, is that it has a function named plot means, which takes the same exact arguments as Oops, didn't load that. There we go. Box plot. And now this plot is a representation of the sampling distribution of the sample means. That is, it is a representation of the central limit theorem approximation of the distribution for the sample means. So here is a 95% percent confidence interval for each superfamily within the order carnivora. 
And now I think the thing to help you best see that these indeed two plots represent different distributions is this plot really only goes from 40 to 90, whereas this plot really goes from zero to 400. The plot of the original data is much wider than the plot of the distribution for the means themselves. Since we have a sample size of 57 for dog-like things and 55 for cat-like things, we are fairly sure where the mean is. That fairly sure bit corresponds to shrinking the range of this y-axis when we plot the representation of the distribution for the sample means meaning we're fairly sure we know where the sample means are. They're somewhere within the 60 to 70 range for dog-like things and maybe lower 50s for cat-like things. But notice still that the distributions here overlap quite a bit, which is telling us that there is a lot of overlap, at least with respect to our uncertainty about where these means are, between the two groups there is significant overlap in our uncertainty between where the means are for these two groups. So here, we are not very confident that dog-like things have a heavier brain than cat-like things. This angle here that you're looking at might have shown up just by chance. We can't say, based on the data we have, that dog-like things have a heavier average brain than cat-like things. So this is probably the best plot you're going to get easily in R, representing the two sample t-tests. And our key takeaway is that this is a model based on conditional densities. This is when x is equal to 0, and this is when x is equal to 1. So we have beta naught at about 65 and beta naught plus beta 1, where here beta 1 is negative, is around 50.